Round two. Uh, so for those of you who missed uh, the first part of this, we're actually recording uh, two episodes today. Uh, we just recorded uh, a whole show on orbit, and now we're going to record a show about animals in space. So uh, once again, we're going to kind of get ready, um, start recording, uh, we'll do the show, and then we'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards and, and answer some questions. So uh, yeah. That is it. Now, if you have any questions, comments, feedback you want to give, you can either post your comment question on YouTube if you're watching it there. You can post it on Google Plus if you're watching it uh, in the Google Plus stream. If you're watching it on the event page, you can post a comment there. Um, or if you're watching it embed mm. Embedded somewhere, <laughs> too much coffee coming back to haunt me. Um, if you're watching it somewhere embedded on, uh, you know, on the internet somewhere, you can use uh, and you love Twitter, you can use the hashtag uh, AstronomyCast, and we'll catch all the comments and questions and uh, try to either fix our mistakes as we record the show or uh, re respond to your questions at the end of the show. So, don't have a lot of time. We've, we've already been at this now for the better part of an hour. So, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to kind of get through this before my kids get back from school. So. Um, cool. Okay. Are you ready to go? I, I, I am, but I, I have to share this one insane tweet that I got before we start recording. Um, this was forwarded by Half Astro. We're, we're currently recording while Hurricane Sandy destroys the uh, eastern seaboard of the United States. It has taken down a crane in Manhattan currently. And um, Francis Boulet, who's someone who I hadn't heard of until I saw this tweet, um, one of his tweets was forwarded by Half Astro, and it says, what if Gangnam Style was actually a giant rain dance, and we've brought this on ourselves? Oh. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so I just, I hope everyone's safe and warm and, and it has a method for surviving without power throughout this horrible storm, and... Yeah. I wonder if people are if the power goes out, people who have never seen it are gonna get a chance to see the Milky Way. That's that's true. That's happened in New York before. I know, yeah. People are like, what's wrong with the, what are those clouds in the sky? Yeah. Those but are that's called stars. Those are called stars. Why is the sky on fire? Yeah. <laughs> um <clears throat> okay, good, good. All right. Well let's uh let's get rolling. Are you are you ready to record? Uh I was. There it is. Sorry, lost okay. the window for a moment. Yes, yes, I'm ready. Okay, I'm going to press record. Okay, I pressed record. Okay, good. And is it yeah. actually recording? No, it's whirly rainbowing. <laughs> <laughs> you switch to Linux. No. Sorry. I'm going to stop. I love Linux, but Linux doesn't let me run Photoshop. Mm. And all of you people who are saying GIMP, no. GIMP, GIMP is not Photoshop, sorry. Okay, let me try this again. And it's recording this time. Okay, good. Hooray for everything. Um, okay, are you ready? Yes. Is your mind ready? No, but that's okay. okay. All right, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 278 for Monday, October 29th, 2012. Animals in space. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Evansville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. So, as we are recording this right now, Hurricane Sandy is uh, chewing up the uh, eastern seaboard. It of is. the United States, so we want to uh, send our, our warm wishes and hopes for safety for everyone involved there. Uh, please uh, keep your head down. And we were, we were just noting this before the show, if it does knock out your power, uh, enjoy this uh, opportunity to see the Milky Way for the first time. Except how are they going to hear us if they've had their power? Never mind. It's, Never mind. Yeah, metaphysics. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to watch it on YouTube through their cell phones, and then they're going to look up and notice that the... Uh, it's a, a great use of battery life during emergency circumstances. Yeah, exactly. So, and I also wanted to think, you know, I, I put a quick post into Astronomy Cast uh, a couple of days ago, sort of mentioning our new super awesome Phases of the Moon app, 
which we've uh, which we've just updated, and now it works on uh, it works on Android, it works on iOS, and I'm holding up to the screen, but the people, I guess, watching the podcast will be able to see it, but it's really cool. You can just kind of drag the moon, drag the Terminator back and forth and see how the phases change, and there's lots of cool stuff. We actually just submitted the uh, iPad app, so and you, you can find that on either iTunes, just search for Phases of the Moon Universe Today, or search for it on the uh, Google Play Store, Phases of the Moon uh, Universe Today, and you'll be able to find it. It's only 99 cents, and uh, it helps us... Uh, feed our children. So. And and what I love about it is is you actually got the librations correct. That well so. yeah, well we actually based it on NASA imagery. So NASA released a whole pile of really highly detailed animations of the moon and we incorporated that into this app. So it's yeah, I've you can actually see the shadows changing over the moon and you can see how the moon wobbles back and forth. So it's it's very cool. Uh, and I hope you people find it very uh, helpful for seeing when the next moon phases are and also just, you know, hand it off to a kid and let them drag right. the moon back and forth to see how it works. So, Cool. All right. Well, let's get rolling with today's episode then. Wait, uh, one more thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I during our last hour of, of recording, which was last week for those of you listening to this on the podcast, uh, we put out a, a plea for people to donate to astrosphere.org to help pay for our server costs. And... I love our listeners. Um, Dom from Dubai, I may not be able to pronounce our listeners. Um, Dom from Dubai tweeted, um, I'm 31 tomorrow. In case anyone wants to get me anything, just click on the donate button uh, to help make more shows. Ta. And I just, I love that Aww. idea that, that someone's asking to have his birthday gifts help get more science out, help us keep our servers turned on and communicate out to the world. So I just wanted to share that piece of awesome human goodness. And during the last hour while we were recording, we actually got two donations. So if any more of you want to help, astrosphere.org. If you go to astronomycast.com, that pays for our audio editing. If you go to astrosphere.org, that helps pay for the servers for the bout forums and, and for yeah, a lot of other things. All the other science outreach that yeah. we're doing. So yeah. Cool. All right. Now can I intro this yeah, to the show? Yeah, now you okay. can enter to the show. All right. So we always think about humans in space, but the cold, hard reality is that animals have always been first in space. First to fly, first to orbit, and sadly, first to die. Let's learn about how our animal companions have been our trusty partners in space exploration, and let's recognize their noble sacrifices over decades of experiments. Yeah, we were not, we have not been very nice to our animal companions. No. as it relates to their sacrifice in space exploration. No. So I, you know, I think this is a kind of morbid episode, but I think it's important to uh, to recognize just how important animals have been in helping out with uh, space exploration. But, so. but it is a good episode as we head into Halloween because it is an episode filled with the creepy crawlies. That's that's true. A scary <laughs> episode. So let's let's go back. Now you actually dug up a really great piece of history uh, for <laughs> for the sort of first animal explorers who have been pushing the boundaries of uh, of uh, not really space exploration, but perhaps uh, air air exploration. So, so, so tell me this. T go with the story. <laughs> so it, one one of the places that. When I'm researching for the show, I go as a starting point is Wikipedia because it links to everything off of that and it usually is filled with all sorts of random esoteric information I wouldn't know to Google. And I came across this sentence that is awesome. It simply reads, animals had been used in aeronautic exploration since 1783 when the Montgolfier brothers sent a sheep, a duck, and a rooster aloft in a hot air balloon, the duck serving as the experimental control. I, it's just there's there's some joke waiting to be told. I don't know what it is. <laughs> the but duck a serving sheep, a duck as a... and a rooster. Yeah, the, but the duck was the control. And the rooster wasn't. I'm not sure what that says about. Well, rooster. but duck flies, right? So a Roosters duck can handle. Tend to fly. Yeah, but, but a duck can, can well. a duck can actually fly and go to high altitude, while a rooster was never meant to, or you know, has long since evolved out of the ability to fly. So I think that was the point: was you know, if a duck is normally able to fly, what would happen to a rooster that uh, you know that doesn't fly? 
So what was the outcome? I obviously not. It, you know. it doesn't. I'm assuming they came back fine. It's not like hot air balloons go very high. With so. the tenor of this episode, I'm going to assume they crashed somewhere <laughs> and were forgotten. I think that would have been listed, though. They didn't list that. So I'm, I'm thinking yeah. it was all good for those three critters. All right. So that's the sort of... But then that was the beginning of, uh, of I guess, airline, air, air travel <laughs> exploration. But let's talk about actual, um, you know, space exploration. So, so when did animals first join... Uh, I guess the uh, the quest to explore the final frontier. Uh, in the 1940s, when, once we had uh, recovered, conquered, stolen, I'm not sure what word we want to go for here, uh, V-2 rockets Liberated. from Germany during World War II, uh, both uh, America, both the United States and the Soviet Union um, had their retinue of stolen German uh, rocket scientists and began to fling things into space. And w what's interesting is is the differences in what got flung by the two nations. Here in the United States, we started simple with fruit flies, went on to rodents, went on to monkeys. Um, the Soviets went to dogs instead. Um, I'm not sure why, I'm not sure what that says, but uh, the Soviets had a long history of sending um, well, mutniks was the, the derogatory term used here in the mutniks? United States. I've never heard that before. Yeah, mutniks. yeah, mutniks to go with Sputniks. Oh, my um, God, I've never heard that. That's awesome. <laughs> and we, we sent up monkeys and, and mice and fruit flies. So it's so, so then what was the first, so what were they doing here? They were testing these out on V2 rockets? Right. So, so it started off with, with fruit flies, uh, just trying to figure out how bad's the radiation, because we had no information about this, what happens is you go up. And, and so start with fruit flies, start with something that, well, they're going to die if you radiate them. Yeah, um, they're fragile. And, yeah, uh, well, Although you would think how hard it is to get rid of fruit flies from your house, but they are. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, radiating them will kill them, unlike cockroaches. But that's we're going to get right. there. Yeah. <laughs> so it started with fruit flies, mice, um, went on to rhesus monkeys. Um, yeah. So one of the interesting things with the fruit flies is is they also were launching moss, and I'm not quite sure what was being looked. At. We look back on these experiments, and it's just sort of like, what were they thinking? But then at the same time, it's like they had no information. No well, they didn't yeah. even know that you could eat in space, right? Yeah. I mean, they weren't sure that you could actually swallow. That somehow gravity was required to get food from your mouth down to your stomach, and they didn't even know. Well, and what gets me is is why yeah. didn't they ask a four, fourth grade girl hanging upside down eating her snack at recess? Because really, we all did it because we were told not to. Yeah. But, but uh, uh, yeah, so yeah. the 1940s were, were the, the years of the fruit flies and the monkeys. Um, and one of the disturbing things was these poor critters, they medical technology wasn't that advanced either so it wasn't like today where you go in and they like tape electrodes all over you and they just have to shave your head if they want to do fancy brainwave analysis and even then they don't have to do much shaving nowadays um, but back then not quite there yet so there was a whole lot of embedding of the electrodes there was no taping of the the heart monitors to the body in the back it was into the body um, so that was a little bit disturbing. Yeah. But then, I mean, these animals weren't expected to survive for very long anyway, so. No, no. So. It was a sad yeah. episode, if you like animals. Um, yeah. <clears throat> right, okay. But they did put them under anesthesia for launch because they didn't want to scare the bejesus out of them. Although I'm not yeah. sure why they thought launch was scarier than zero gravity. Or having electrodes implanted in your head. But, well, um, yeah. Yeah, so, right, okay. So they, so then what are, what was sort of like a first real important, you know, animal experiment that was done? I, I think the first big one that people pay attention to um, might be Laika. It was the Soviet dog who orbited all the way around the planet. Um, a lot of people also look back and remember the the monkeys, Abel and um, Baker, Miss Baker. She actually lived at the Huntsville Space and Rocket Center until 1984, and lots of people got to see her in the public while she was on display there. Um, right, so that's a successful return to Earth. That's yeah. a, you know, 
That's and and Leica was not with... a successful return. Leica it's okay. orbited. So let's start with Leica then. So can you can you sort of t talk about the Leica mission and and right. what happened? So so Leica was the second uh, ever orbiting spacecraft. Um, and it carried the first animal into orbit. And this was a Soviet spacecraft, November 3rd, 1957. Uh, Laika was just a happy pooch with pointy ears, easy to draw cartoon characters of, stamps made after Laika. And um, Laika died during flight because, well, they, they didn't know how to bring Laika back. So this was one of those points in history where we had the technology to launch things had the technology to orbit things, did not have the technology to bring things back. So right. Leica went up, Leica orbited, Leica proved that it's safe to orbit, Leica was put to sleep. Right. And I and so Leica sort of crashed or or I mean did could Leica actually survive in orbit or was the actual Leica orbit? survived in orbit, yeah. They just you how how long are you going to keep a dog alive in space? Well, they figured that one out later, but um, right. yeah. And so this was like this was the first mission, like right after Sputnik, right? It, it not right after, but yeah, it was the, it was. But you yeah. said like the next orbit, right? So Sputnik it was the next was the orbiting first. flight. Yeah. yeah, and then this is okay. So so this was Leica. Sputnik two. Right, and so it carried a little dog inside. It, it was, yeah. I mean, Leica was like a little, like almost like a Jack Russell Terrier, like a little dog, right? Yeah, a little pointy-eared, cute yeah. dog. Lots of yeah. cartoons. Mm -hmm. So, and and this was followed in in 1958 by um, a squirrel monkey getting launched from here in the United States, um, and and then we had. Miss Abel and sorry, we had Miss Baker and Abel that went up um, in 1959. So, so the 1950s were were the years of the dogs and monkeys. Um, also of note were several frogs, lots of mice, um, small critters. Uh, along the way, the the basic idea was to to try and get a sense of how does weight weightlessness affect biological processes? What are the harm of um, Various, I mean, basically, can can you? They, they launched eggs. Can the eggs be hatched once you bring them back down to Earth? Wow! Um, all sorts of different things, um, but it it was mostly they were worried about will things survive. Now, the first critters to be brought back um, from orbit were were because. Abel and Baker didn't orbit; they just went up. Um, in in the 1960s, uh, Sputnik Five went up with Belka and Strelka. So this was uh, the first one to orbit animals, bring the animals back. And what's kind of neat is um, one of the the puppies of Strelka uh, was given to Carolyn Kennedy um, by Nikita Khrushchev. And and one of the side effects of this is there's now like long lines of space puppies that I want a space <laughs> Isn't dog. That kind of awesome. Yes, I didn't know. I, I totally want a space dog. So yeah, these these are the things that we have done is we have sent dogs to space, we have returned dogs back. to space, we have bred the dogs that went into right. space, we have turned them into political pets right. from space. I totally want one. That's awesome. <laughs> um, right, okay. And so but, but the point here is that these these dogs were returned safely to Earth and able to breed afterwards and yeah. I mean this is part of the experiment, right? I mean yeah. this is like, okay, so we send a dog we send a dog to orbit, bring it back. Can it breed? And, yes. Because and, and, they didn't know, right? No. They didn't know any of this stuff. And and so then the, the next big breakthrough was figuring out if you send something into space, can can it think? Can can it can it maintain the ability to do activities? Right. Um, so like, is your brain gonna like work with the glucose? It, it do you Move become dumb proper. like you do at altitude because <laughs> right. there, there's yeah. all sorts of stories of people working to build telescopes at the tops of mountains or climbing high peaks where they simply lose reality. Um, it, it's the no matter how long I keep cutting it, it's still too short. It's, it's problems <laughs> like that. Yeah. And, and this is where Ham the Chimp came in. This was the, the first chimp sent into space. He was a friendly little soul. And um, he actually went into space and he pulled levers. And, and 
the the good and the bad of this was he was trained to pull the levers in order to get banana treats, but if he didn't, he'd get shocked. So what? it was one of these. They did both the shocking and the treating, and yeah, so yeah, yeah it was the nineteen sixties. Yeah. So um, yeah. I believe that would be an animal rights violation right there. I'm not sure. That's the part that bothers me. Yeah. I'm pretty but, sure that's but the, legal. Right. And so I guess the point here, right, is that they didn't know. I mean, they knew that yeah. if you were at high altitude, your brain didn't work right. And I'm sure, you know, to a certain extent, they knew that a lot of this was caused by the low air pressure and the lack of oxygen getting to your brain. But could there be something else just about right. being far away from Mother Earth that and, would affect you in orbit? And they didn't know. And so, so they taught this chimp a whole pile of really sort of cool tricks and then send him to space and see if he could perform these tricks the same way. And and this was kind of the last test before they let human chimps go into space. Because uh, one of the complaints of the early astronauts were they were being tra treated like trained monkeys. They weren't given their own uh, buttons to escape out. They weren't given very many controls. It, it was they wanted to fully automate the rockets. And um, so Ham was the trained monkey that pre Pre, uh, preluded the astronauts who felt they were trained monkeys. Um, right. And uh, Ham successfully proved that you could do it. He came back, uh, happily uh, continued to interact with his trainers. Um, yeah, it, it was all good. Um, I would think he wouldn't have liked those trainers after they shocked him, but... But anyway, well... continue. <laughs> so so it, as... as time progressed, more and more nations began to get get into the Launching Mammals into Space Act. We had France flying rats in the 1960s. France did have a space program at one point. Um, we had China in the 1960s launching rodents. Uh, the Russians continued to launch their dogs. And this was one that when I tried to research it, I wish I could have found more information because in the 1960s, at the beginning of the Voskhod program, they launched two dogs for over 20 days. And I'm trying to figure out, I can figure out how they fed them, I can figure out how they watered them, but were they like floating in a capsule filled with, well, processed food and water? It's not like you can catheter a dog that, did they catheter the dog? And, and they how they had some kind of fancy diaper on. And then they would have had some kind of feeding days? tube. I know. Whatever. It's dogs. They're cruel <laughs> to animals. Send them to space. Let them, you know, poop in their diapers and eat from tubes. And, you know, they probably kept, kept them constrained in some kind of harness. And, and yeah. Used airflow? I, I'm hoping they used airflow. Cause, cause... I don't think they cared. Yeah, that's what bugs me. Yeah. And I, the other part that bugs me is here I am, 38 years old, and what's the first question I have? What happened to the canine poo and pee? Yeah. But yes, that's exactly where my brain went. Yeah, they just didn't care. But but I mean, they sent, I mean, you, you know, there was uh, later on in the, with the Gemini missions, they had a couple of astronauts up there for the better part of, what, two weeks? It was pretty complicated, and they had a lot of, you know, that kind of thing going on. I'm, you know, read some of you the. You have to have no privacy concerns if no you're. No privacy. Yeah, if you Everything watch like from the out. Earth to the Moon and you see <laughs> what they were in, uh, how small that capsule was, uh, it's just astounding that they lived through it. I mean, Apollo was like a luxury hotel compared yeah. to the Gemini mission. So, yeah. so okay. So we've got some dogs up there for 20 days, which is a you know fantastic feat, and it shows that a living creature can survive in space for 20 days. And and so we're now entering the period of time where where the Americans and the Soviets are successfully launching humans. We're seeing other nations work to launch robot ro to robots. launch rodents. Rodents. Um, and and looking through this history, you find all these nations that I I wasn't aware had their own space programs. Argentina launched a rat. Um, and, and so there's just all of these people thinking we're going to be next. And no, it was America and the Soviet Union that kept going. Yeah. But, but over time, we, we began launching more and more different critters, trying to understand the effects of zero-G. One of my favorite stories is during Skylab in 1973. Um, they started doing student programs where they allowed students to uh, suggest various projects that could be done in space. And one of the suggested, suggested projects was to launch spiders and see yeah. what would happen. And and 
the, the reality is spiders do not like zero G. They will not leave their little test tubes unless forced. They will cling to their, their test tubes. When you force them out of their, their test tubes, they uh, attempt to swim through zero G. Um, but once you uh, get them going, they will build webs that aren't quite up to snuff compared to what you see on the planet Earth. But over time, they, they uh, increased their ability. What was kind of awesome with this particular experiment is the first web that got built was a somewhat drunken-looking web, but it was recognizable as, as this is a spider web with a spider sitting in the spider web. And because spiders can go a long time without eating, they, they'd fed the spiders prior to launch and figured they kill the spiders before they needed to eat again. But they were the astronauts were so thrilled with the results of the initial experiment that they like were feeding the spiders pieces of rare meat to keep them wow. going. <laughs> and unfortunately the spiders eventually died of dehydration. They, they were provided water but apparently zero G water sponge spiders just didn't get the whole notion real well. Um, right but they just didn't you know they didn't plan for the possibility that the, the astronauts would want to take care of the spiders and continue watching them and seeing how they learned over time. But, it's, but I mean, it's other experiments awesome. later on came along, I know, and started to take, you know, multiple generations into account. A lot of these long duration space flights went into that. And, and right now on the International Space Station, just to jump forward, uh, we, we have with the International Space Station, they just finished uh, installing on the Japanese experiment module a really neat fish tank. And I, I'm a big fan of fish tanks. And this is like the, the best fish tank ever. No cleaning of the fish tank is required. Um, and, and their goal is to figure out uh, what happens to multiple generations of fish born in space. And it had never really occurred to me that fish suffer the same bone degeneration that astronauts suffer because, but you're weightless in water, but you're not actually weightless in water. You're suspended in the water, but there's still all the gravitational effects on, on your biology. And, and in space, you don't have that. So they have these, uh, they have this really neat fish tank uh, with, with, neat little fish in it and they're planning to go through multiple generations of the fish to see uh, what ends up happening. Uh, is there a higher mutation rate? Is uh, just There's so many different questions to be asked and, and we have found examples of space changing biology. Salmonella becomes much much more virulent in space yeah. um, and I can imagine food poisoning actually turns you into a rocket in space so really those two shouldn't be mixed. Water bears become more adorable. <laughs> They're just adorable anyways. Yeah. Um, uh, right. Well, and th I mean, this Soyuz just docked just like a week ago yeah, with, these, with, fish. with these fish. Yeah, yes. which is great. Okay. So, but when last we saw our heroes, we were looking at the spider on the Soyuz capsule. Oh, sorry. On the, um, on the, the space station. Uh, space, right? space lab. Yeah, on yeah. space lab. But I mean, then there was years and years of the space shuttle missions and the International Space Station. I mean, there was a ton more experiments done with plants, with animals. And it and it wasn't on. just it it wasn't just with those. There were there was also the tomato seeds in space in the in the early eighties, um, which which then got brought back and given to schools all across America to grow to see if the tomato seeds would continue to grow. There have been a ton of spiders sent into space, a ton of mice sent into space, mice born in space, uh, and and what's interesting is it's actually challenging to find results from these stories because um, the results just other than the salmonella becoming much more virulent I it there's hasn't been anything so earth-shattering that it's it's made the cover of science or nature so biology seems to be pretty happy to go in space there's just a lot of brain uh, bone degeneration not brain degeneration bone degeneration going on now there's one tragic story about an animal in space. I don't know if you know about this one, about the, uh, I think there were some nematode worms. On, oh, yeah. And on this the, one actually isn't a tragedy, I don't think. On, well, on Columbia, right? The Columbia was a tragedy. Yes. So the, the last mission of the Columbia, um, the, the first space flying space shuttle, and, and it unfortunately blew up in 2003, um, 
it was doing an experiment with worms called nematodes and they were in a special container that somehow they managed to survive the explosion of the Columbia during re-entry, uh, survive the high, high heat, survive impact, and this was one of those moments of, well, we know that when big enough asteroids hit the Earth, it sent debris and dinosaurs into space, and we now know that the nematodes could survive re-entry. So ideas behind panspermia become much more realistic. And yeah. and it's also a little bit terrifying how hard it is to kill a nematode. Yeah, yeah. And so there were generations and generations of these nematodes that that had been, I know, passed around. You know, researchers were able to get, get their hands on them and, and be able to do experiments on them and continue on the lines of them. And, and yeah, they kind of survived. Which is back to that concept not kind of, of they did survive they did survive and you know and it's like the the water bears right that yeah. pe- that water bears can withstand almost anything and go to space they really truly will be our future uh, uh, you know space travelers so I mean where do we stand now I mean some fish we just sent some fish to the space station do you think we'll ever see you know more permanent like pets in space you um, know, things like I, a dog in space or a monkey in space. So- one of the things that Bigelow is doing that I'm not sure if they're intending for this to be pets or not is I don't think they're intending it for it to be pets. But but I know folks that own Madagascar hissing cockroaches as pets because they're giant cockroaches, seven inches long sometimes, and they like to hiss. And um, for a variety of different reasons, including the fact that these suckers can survive in near vacuum. Uh, Bigelow has launched them and scorpions and other creepy crawlies into space in their Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 inflatable modules. And and they're basically looking at, well, what are the effects on zero-g on these biologicals? And it's it's kind of extraordinarily gross. But this is what Bigelow is doing. Um, they haven't launched any bed bugs yet, so I think their 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 hotel business is still still in in line to be doing just fine. But wouldn't it uh, be a nightmare if the <laughs> if the Bigelow hotel gets infested with bed bugs? How would you, you know, get rid? You of don't. Them? Well, <laughs> you just like, give up. You give just up. Deorbit. <laughs> Deorbit. Yeah, that's it. Cool. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we're we're good for uh, for animals in space, Pamela. So thank you once again, and uh, and again, I hope everyone on the East Coast is uh, stay safe with uh, Hurricane Sandy, and we will see everybody next week. Sounds great, Fraser. I'll talk to you later. Save. Yeah, I was struggling to find the why did Bigelow launch all of these critters, and it seems to be a because they could and because they'd likely survive, and it would be no fun one, to video. No one stopped to wonder if they should. You don't like hissing cockroaches, do you? I'm not a, a, a fan of hissing cockroaches, no. Any bug that will make angry noises at me? <laughs> yeah. That's a surprising bug. Okay, so uh, and I know we both got to roll pretty quick. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so I, if anyone has some quick questions, we can take them. Um, Short questions. So uh, Guido Bibra mentions uh, in the Wikipedia article that Laika didn't survive very long because the temperature control malfunctioned, so she probably died just a few hours after launch and not days. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Guido. Um, uh, Joey Freeway wants to know, uh, are there some good books about astronomy, science, and something in that direction? So uh, we always recommend that if you ha- if this is the first time you've ever seen Astronomy Cast, this is episode 278. So we have covered every single topic in space and astronomy that you can imagine, from black holes, dark energy, dark matter, the ultimate fate of the universe, uh, multiple dimensions, space exploration, every planet, you name it, we've done it. So... Uh, Go back into our archive. Now, what about books? What do you like for books? 
Oh man, the problem that we run into is books change so rapidly. If if you're in the mood for just a, a good sit down, learn some history, nothing too deep and mathematical, I'd pick up anything by Dava Sorbel. She wrote Galileo's Daughter and um, Latitude, I think, was the name of one of her others. Um, she's she's just an excellent writer. Gives great historical context on things. Uh, if you want to get a good sense of what the community of amateur astronomy is like, Seeing in the Dark by Timothy. Ferris is another good book. Can't go wrong and with Carl Sagan, Pale Blue Dot. Um, uh, the science in most of Cosmos. Sagan's stuff is starting to get really out of date is the problem. That's true, yeah. So anything prior to 1998, it, astronomy got turned on its head with the discovery of dark energy. So I'd, I'd be extremely cautious of reading anything published any earlier than 2002. Uh, and that's Neil why it becomes Tyson so Tyson has far. some great books recently. Um... Uh, Mike Death Brown. from the Skies by Phil Plate. Phil Plate. That, yeah. That's Phil an Plate's easy and fun read. Yeah, and yeah, Death from the Skies and uh, uh, Mike Brown just did uh, what? What is Pluto? Why I killed Pluto and why I had it coming. <laughs> um, so Charles Beller asks, uh, "Can you step on a cockroach in space?" You can, but you have to brace against a wall. <laughs> brace against a wall. So really, really wedge yourself in there and yeah. then step on the cockroach or step on the cockroach and then careen across the spacecraft after you've, you know, imparted the energy. Well, you, you then have to, like, fling yourself off of it and bounce off of the dead carcass. Yeah. <laughs> you can't just, like, put your foot out and squish it because, yeah, that, it, it, that whole equal and opposite force thing. So Rob Ross asks, has anyone tried to do a cockroach, let a cockroach do an EVA? with no suit and see how long it, it lasts. Well, sort of. I mean, that's the crazy thing is the answer is sort of because Bigelow, uh, with their first Genesis 1 when it went up, uh, it they, they weren't contained in environmentally controlled units. So there was this period of time during which the, the inflatable capsule wasn't inflated and so these critters did undergo the vacuum of space. And cockroaches are good with that. <laughs> with that... Come only on. temporarily. Only temporarily. temporarily. Okay, all right. Now, water bears are good with that. Yes, they are. Yeah, water bears will take that and uh, say, please, sir, can I have some more? Yeah, they will handle high heat, cold, no oxygen, no food. And uh, they'll be yes. cute the entire time. <laughs> they'll be adorable, it's, unless you really look close at them. Uh, but, yeah, d definitely Google water bears, and, uh, and you will see an animal that is built for space. Yeah. Um, uh... So this is interesting. So Graham Stickings asks, um, what about, given what was said about spiders and zero-g, what about a program that attempts to simulate gravity in space? Now, there was a program. I don't know if you remember this. I don't think it ever happened. The magnetic levitation one? Well, no, there's the one about simulating. Uh, some people wanted to grow some, wanted to spin a satellite and, and put rats in it. Oh, right. No, that, yeah. that didn't end up happening, but yeah. It didn't end up was... happening, but it seemed brilliant. I mean, it was perfect, right? You take a satellite, launch it into space, Give it a spin and then see if you can breed rats and how long they can survive in this kind of micro, you know, artificial gravity in space. So and I it was a the, great idea. the issue with that is you have to have such a large diameter to end up having sufficient gravity over sufficient height away from the surface. Otherwise, you end up with your feet and your head having radically different gravities. Um, and then so that's the question the, again. Once again, will that will that work? Will you be driven mad with space madness? But, yeah, but I mean, I that really is the solution. I mean, for us to do long-term, you know, existence in space. Babylon 5 got it right. Yeah, we've got to have some kind of rotating spacecraft where art we can create artificial gravity. And it's probably going to be some situation where you've got, you know, a capsule on one end, and then you've got this big, long tether, and then some counterweight, and then they just rotate. And, you know, the farther you can put the counterweight in the capsule, the safer and more stable this is going to be. And then, of course, you've got to somehow undo it when you get to the other well, point. So, and, you know, and that's not the only model. Yeah, there's yeah. there's the there's the disk rotating, there's the big cylinder rotating, the Babylon 5 model, Ender's Game, you have Battle School. These, yeah. these are all various rotating spacecraft. Yeah, so that's that's got to be the solution, is some kind of, of rotating situation. And, and, you know, I'm surprised, actually, that, that more research hasn't been done into that yet. It requires so. so much weight being launched into space. That's that's the problem is it it's 
so expensive to to launch things. I think it's like thir almost forty megajoules per kilogram of energy right. required. So anyway, that's uh, that's the future. So cool. Okay, well, I think we should probably wrap things up then. I know you've got to run. I got to run. Yeah. Uh, so thanks again, Pamela, for the the uh, twofer, and uh, we will see you next week. Uh, next up Wednesday, you've got the uh, weekly Cosmo Quest Science Hour. Yes. And we have no topic yet. So no topic yet. Right. Idea. And then Thursday, we've got the weekly space hangout. So uh, yeah. All right. All good. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you very much, Pamela, once again, for unloading your brain in front of us. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll, see you, uh, we'll see you all next time. Sounds great. Talk to you later.